that. So tonight we are going to continue our study uh, over the life of Christ, and we have made our way to uh, the basically the beginning or the start of the uh, ministry or thereof of Christ. Uh, so we are going to be um, in Matthew, mostly in Matthew three tonight, uh, which is where John starts to prepare the way for Jesus. He comes out and then. Um, starts to speak of the things that are about to come, the things that are about to happen, and then hopefully we will actually get to the baptism of Jesus, and then we will move on into Jesus in the wilderness and the temptation of Jesus next week. That is the plan. We will see how that goes. By all means, please uh, chip into this study as much as uh, you have good comments, I guess, and uh, we will just see where it leads us. So where he leads, we will follow as uh, we sing sometimes, right, Brian? Right. So in Matthew 3... Verse 1 through, um, verse one through uh, 12. I'll start reading there and then we'll kind of go over it. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brought of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in the keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His, uh, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And I'm already getting water, and we're only like a reading 12 verses in. All right. So in Matthew 3, 1, it says, in those days. Now, you don't really get a lot of context as to in those days, but if you were to look at Luke 3, 1, you would see in the 15th year, um, and then you start going over the reign of uh, Caesar, Pontius Pilate, so on and so forth. You can see that in Luke 3, 1. We're not going to get into a lot of the history tonight. I really want to focus on John preparing the way and then into the baptism of Jesus. But it says, in those days... John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And then it says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you, uh, if you look at Matthew 4, verses 17, so I've got to flip a page, but some of y'all might just have to move down. Jesus actually says something extremely similar, where he says, For, the or it says, for that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, when you think of our preaching today, uh, the second coming of Christ is at hand. Heaven awaits us. It is at hand. Why would I say it's at hand, right? It's not because of what's going on in the world. And uh, as some people would say, you know, what, uh, what chapter of Revelation are we living out today, right? That's not it. What times are we in right now? The end times, right? The last times. Well, how do we know that? When did the end times or the last times begin? Right? Once Jesus came died, went back to heaven, right? Seated at the throne. Then what times are we in? We're in those last times. Because what's the time to come after this? Judgment, right? So what's at hand? Our forever home is at hand, right? The way that we live today, right? How are we living today? What's at stake? What's at hand? Our forever home, right? What, what awaits us after this life, after this struggle, after this, uh, this stroll, this walk on life? What awaits us? Well, hopefully heaven awaits us, right? Hopefully it's not opposite of that. So Jesus preached uh, the similar message, as, or said a similar statement, uh, preached 
of course, the same thing because they're both preaching um, the same message, right? Um, and as you look at the, the word repent, uh, most of the time it typically will mean uh, change of one's mind, right? Which is what it would mean for us today, right? You would repent, repent, and when you repent, you would have a change of one's mind. Uh, the Greek, though, here in this context actually gives more of a meaning of it's a uh, feel remorse, repent, right? Or be converted, right? So he's saying repent, right? He's saying feel remorseful, repent, or be converted for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? So who's he speaking to here? Jews, right? Convert to this way that's coming, right? The way is here, right? And we're going to see kind of as he, as he goes into this story a little bit more in some of the other uh, Gospels. But uh, it's, it's giving this meaning um, of the feel remorseful, repent, or be converted. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, and if you look, uh, Jesus, when he was speaking to the 12, disi- disciple, the 12 apostles in Matthew 10, 6-7... Uh, Jesus says this, But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Can we notice the theme about our life today? Can we notice the theme about the message, the story that we ought to be telling the world? What should we be telling the lost? The kingdom of God is at hand. Judgment day is at hand. Your salvation is at hand. Your forever home is at hand. It's at stake, right? Right? Uh, the life that we live is impacting the life that we are going to inherit for eternity, right? This is a big thing, right? This is not just one of those things you can just, you know, uh, piece it together and be like, ah, wait till tomorrow and then we'll figure it out, right? It's about making today the most that you can make of today. It's about winning today, right? Why do we need to try to win tomorrow if we haven't even made it to tomorrow, right? What does Matthew tell us about that? The gospel? It says, tomorrow's got enough worries of its own. Right? So let's focus on today because what is it? The kingdom, of he- the kingdom, right? Judgment could come today, could it not? That's not a scare tactic, but it very well could come today, right? That's how we have to live our lives. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Um, we were speaking about that a little bit before, before um, the lesson this, this uh, afternoon. But win today. Win today, and then we can focus on tomorrow if tomorrow comes. Uh, so Jesus right there in Matthew 10 is a similar, uses a similar message and then also, um, when you look at it, some versions, which New King James probably says this, but it could say the kingdom of heaven is near or has come near. It's now nearer than it was before, isn't it? And if we make it to tomorrow, what is it now, now done? It's now even more near, right? Nearer, 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 right? It, be, keeps, it keeps becoming closer, right? Uh, it is a, it's a thing that is promised to happen. We know it's going to happen. And so it says, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or it's now become near. Uh, Verse 3, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And this is coming from Isaiah 40 and verse 3. And you'll see that all throughout the, the different gospels here. Now, John is coming out of the wilderness with a voice crying, one of repentance, right? One crying of people to turn and and chase after because the kingdom is at hand. Sometimes, though, uh, when we're in this world, it can feel like we are the one voice crying out from the wilderness, right? We are just caught up in between the trees, and it seems like there is just walls of enemies all around us. And we are crying out, we ought to be crying out the same message that John is crying out. Coming out of the wilderness, right? This world, is this world our home? It's not our home, right? We're just a passing through, right? This is just a temporary stop, right? Uh, You go to Bucky's for two hours and you could have a great time or you could come to earth, live it for a little bit and then get to go experience heaven, right? It's just a temporary stop. And so as we walk through this wilderness, as we walk through this foreign land, right? We should be crying out. John's crying out, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. How should we be crying out as we walk through the wilderness of this life? The same message to all the folks that are lost. The same message to those folks uh, that have not um, come to know Christ, have not um, lived, lived their life chasing after Him. And it says, prepare the way of the Lord, make His path straight. So what is the, uh, what's the goal for John the Baptist? What is his aim here in life? He's got a little bit of a lofty one, doesn't he? 
a lofty goal. What should we be doing in our life today? A similar thing, right? Now, we don't have... Now, John's got... He's literally welcoming in the physical Jesus, right? But what can we be doing? By our actions, by the way that we speak, we can be preparing people to what? To see Christ. And it could even be seeing Christ in a different light, right? Uh, there's tons of people that uh, won't come back to church because they've been hurt by a church. They've been hurt by a Christian, right? Well, our actions can show them that, yeah, there is broken people, right? In churches, right? But God's love, God's forgiveness still reigns, right? So the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness that we show others, right? It can help introduce them, reintroduce them to their Savior, Mark. Yeah, and you even you mentioned there him him correcting the apostles. You got to think, and we'll get to this later. But uh, there's even sometimes where people will just get up and leave Jesus. They think he's speaking crazy, right? They say this message, nope. And then and then even uh, uh, when Jesus starts speaking speaking of uh, divorce and remarriage, right? People they're like, well, how? Don't you think that's a little bit strict, right? And G, I mean, G, does Jesus change? He said, no, that's just the way it is, right? Um, and then you can even go and look at um, uh, Peter gets corrected, right? Um, later on in, is it Galatians maybe? I'm blanking on which it's Philippians or Galatians. Um, take that back. It might be 2 Thessalonians. Um, whenever, he, uh, whenever he basically changes the way he acts uh, based off who he's eating with. Um, and so, right, we can't show, um, we must be, a follower of Christ all the way through, no matter who we're around. We must always be shining the light of Christ. Uh, Joe? Yeah, and I, the study that I looked at, I don't know if it's the same one you're, yours referenced or not, but it gave statistics of uh, younger adults who actually just attend church. And the attending of church was like, I think it was like once a month. Like it was very low attendance. It wasn't like it was every Sunday or anything like that. Um, and it was, their 20-year-olds is probably now in, in my, my range, or their 18-year-olds, but it was like 24, 26% actually attended. I mean, it's a shocking number when you really start looking at it, right? Only a quarter of young adults even attend church. Uh, and we talked about this earlier, too. Uh, we always like to put it on, and I actually preached on this maybe three or four years ago, but we always like to say the younger generation just doesn't get it. Well, who helped raise the younger generation? It's not all the younger generation. Now, I'm not saying that it's all the older generation or you know, everybody else above the younger generation is to blame either, but... We had, as we talked about earlier, we've made some mistakes along the way, and now sometimes we're seeing some of the uh, repercussions of that, right? Um, our faithfulness to attend, what does that show our younger generation? Our faithfulness to show forgiveness and grace and mercy to others, what is that telling our younger generation? Uh, our quickness to anger, our, uh, our quickness to um, slight somebody, right? What is that teaching our younger generation? Where did they learn that habit, Right? And so we have to look at that as what well, the, the same way, right? Uh, the same way that, that Paul calls out folks, right? It's all about getting better today. And of course, we're all going to have mistakes. 
but it's all about getting better today. What example are we sharing for our future generation, right? Um, let's see, verse 4. Now John wore a garment of uh, camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. This is probably one of my uh, just favorite descriptive verses in all of Scripture. Uh, I just always try to envision this guy walking out of the wilderness, and it's just a beautiful picture. It's just awesome. Uh, he's definitely, you know, if you translate that today, he's straight from East Tennessee. It's great stuff, right? I just kid. I thought about making an Alabama joke, but I didn't do it. So, does anybody remember uh, who else maybe wore something similar to this in the Old Testament? Anybody besides Dale? As he instantly answers it. Does anybody remember who also wore something similar to this in the Old Testament? Who is John compared to? Or who is John questioned as if that's who he is? Elijah, right? So, if you go to... Uh, uh, sec, or yeah, Second Kings one eight. Uh, Elijah is mentioned um, with the exact same kind of concept, right? They said, "Oh, this must be uh, Elijah." And so he's got camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Now I like me some wild honey. Maybe locust also tastes good if you uh, just cover it uh, with wild honey. I don't know, but Dale has been talking a lot about. Well, I guess it's about three or four weeks ago. Was talking about the uh, plagues. And uh, locust is one of them, is it not, back there in Egypt? And so uh, it's a swarming, it's a leaping insect. Uh, it would just be, um, I can't even imagine just being surrounded by that many uh, grasshoppers. Whatever. It's, just, it's just wild to me, you know. You see, uh, I watched a video of this guy yesterday. Poor guy, he was, uh, he's in some higher up position in some business, I don't know. But he was working from home because he had to have a pest uh, control person come out to his house because he had a squirrel issue. And uh, I guess they were invading his home. I don't know. But this guy was petrified of squirrels. So he's on this Zoom conference meeting, whatever it is, talking to his team. And uh, if you watch the video, I don't know why he recorded himself. Uh, but anyways, he has this baseball bat, a wooden baseball bat, leaned up against his window next to his desk. And he jumps out of his chair in the middle of this meeting as he's talking, just panicking. And he grabs his bat and starts just screaming. I mean, just like... <laughs> Like, a, like an eight-year-old, I don't know. He's just screaming, swinging this baseball bat all over the place during the middle of the same thing. And he's terrified of one squirrel. Now this squirrel comes straight at him. It just flies and jumps right at him, probably scared just as much as he is. Could you imagine how much locust there was in Egypt, though? Oh, my goodness. Everywhere, right? Everywhere. Uh, and so uh, it, can, I mean, it can just absolutely devour crops and other plant. Um, and you can see that if you go back to... Uh, when the locusts over, uh, basically overran Egypt um, during the eighth plague. Um, oh, there you are. Oh, man, when they come out after that long rest. It was wild. Yeah, and they were... I remember my swing, the swing set or whatever it was back at my house. I don't even remember what year that was, but I mean it was. I mean it was covered. I mean it looked like almost not snow. But I mean it looked like just dirt all over the ground. I mean it's just wild how many there were. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. And if you put some wild honey on it, you might be able to eat like John. Very popular in China. All right, so uh, come back Sunday morning, and uh, Joe is going to bring uh, some cicadas with wild honey on it for everybody. My son-in-law has on. He says, I eat a lot of things on Sunday. We wouldn't think about eating this. One of the ways they prepare their food. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dale, I've apologized in advance. Well, that's good. I know you're going to do it. I apologize no one comes Sunday morning. Joe's offer did not work. Uh, and so, anyways, that's kind of the uh, description you get of John as he, as he enters into the descriptive portion of it. Then in verse 5, it says, then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region about the Jordan was going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Uh, one thing that you're going to see a lot of, um, and this goes way, we'll talk about this way later on. But when it says in all the region, all the people close by were going to him and were, and were what? Being baptized, right? There was a, there, there's not like this is just a handful of people. Uh, one of the biggest arguments you'll hear uh, for belief alone is going to be the thief on the cross. I love it how they bring up the thief on the cross, but they don't even know his name. 
uh, let alone the fact that they just refused to even acknowledge this verse that all those people in that region were going there, and that guy very well could have. Uh, they don't know anything about the guy. They just know that uh, Jesus said, you know, I'll see you in paradise. So they but they don't mention anything else about his life. So if you ever hear that argument, just ask him what his name is and then just see why they know so much about why he wasn't baptized, but they don't know what his name is or literally any other fact about him, right? It's just a speculation they make. It's not even biblical. Uh, this one on Sunday night. Come back Sunday night and Dale will speak all about it. I love it. Um, Let's see. So all of them were going out uh, about the Jordan, were going to him, and they were baptized by him in the River Jordan. Now, the Jordan River is the largest river in Israel. Uh, there's two different names that you can kind of go back to that get debated. Uh, one of them is, uh, is the Hebrew word that means descender, uh, and it, it kind of links back to the region of Dan, so it would be the River of Dan. The other one that's been linked to is a Hebrew, Hebrew word for judges, so it would be the River of Judges or Water Judges. Right, so I guess it's a it's not judgment free water. Uh, the water does judge, but anyways. So the river um, that flows it flows down from uh, the mount south to the Sea of Galilee and then to the Dead Sea. So um, and they were confessing their sins. Right, they were um, they were they were having an omission of the wrongdoing of the sin. They were confessing it um, at this point as well. So we have to think about that. Uh, verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brought of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You brought of vipers. Jesus used the exact same language in Matthew 23, 33, when he is speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. Mark did a lesson on uh, the woes, gosh, I don't know, a year ago maybe? I don't remember when it was, eight months ago? I don't remember. Um, but brought of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? When I was reading this actually earlier today, when I was just kind of going over notes, that right there actually stuck out to me. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the broad of vipers part. It was the, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Question mark. And then I said, well, who warned me from the wrath to come? Who warned you from the wrath to come? What is the wrath to come? judgment, right? Uh, the wrath to come is the wrath of God that is coming, right? Which is going to be judgment for those who don't follow him, right? It's going to be victory for those who do follow him. Who warned you of the wrath to come? I actually texted the person as I was sitting there going over the notes because the person that warned me was a person that I probably, I don't know, rejected through this kind of, you know, blew off. I, don't, I can't tell you how many times. And he just kept coming back. Uh, I don't know. He's just uh, like a mosquito bite that just keeps itching. He just, kept, he just kept going, right? But he kept showing love and grace. No matter how many times I just kind of shook him off, he kept coming back, right, to warn me of it. Who warned you of the wrath to come? I think it's a great question that we should think about tonight. Other thing that we should think about on the flip side of that is, who are you warning of the wrath to come, right? Can someone say about you that you were the person that warned them of the wrath to come? Because we should all be affecting someone's life, telling them about the wrath, right? The wrath of God that is coming. So, food for thought as you leave here. Uh, verse 8, bear fruit in the keeping with repentance. When you look at the conversion story uh, or the conversation between Paul and King Agrippa in Acts 26, 19 through 23, it says this, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly visions, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and all throughout the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds and keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had to help that to this day I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. You notice what it says in verse, uh, in verse 20? That they should repent and turn to God and then do what? 
performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. What is that saying to us? Got to be real? Can't be lip service. It's got to be something. Even who believes? Even Satan and his angels believe. If that's all you got, then you got the exact same thing as Satan. And where'd that get him? Not heaven. Right? Do you have more than that? Or is it just lip service? See, that goes back to the question I raised earlier. Who warned you of the wrath to come and who are you warning of the wrath to come? Are you, are you in Christ right now? Is someone warning you and you haven't, you haven't heeded that warning? Are you warning other people of the wrath to come? Are you living out the mission that God has put before all of us, right? Are you planting seeds, watering, letting God give the increase? So that's what Paul was doing. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. What is bearing fruit? What do you got to do to bear fruit? You got to be living. Do dead uh, trees or any, does, it, does a dead apple tree bear apples? It doesn't. Then why can we expect a dead spiritual body to, to bear good spiritual fruit? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. So bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And why would you want to bear fruit with keeping with repentance? What is repentance? It's a what? Turn it. It's a changing, right? So if you're changing, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be doing the actions that go along with that. And do not presume... And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. When I read verse 9 and 10, really just verse 9, um, do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham. For us today, do not presume to yourself to say that someone else in your family was a preacher or some great Christian and therefore that you are now saved or you're now taken care of. We must be doing what with our salvation? Working it out. Does it say to uh, hang on to the coattails of somebody else in your family? It's up to us, right? Working out your own salvation. It's up to us. So do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. What is, uh, we're going to talk about this next week, hopefully. What does uh, Jesus get tempted with in the wilderness whenever he's hungry? Stone, right? You think Jesus could have turned into bread? Right right here, John said he could, he, he could turn those stones, raise up children for Abraham, right? He even gave uh, Abraham a child at a late age, did he not? And what did uh, Sarah do? Laughed. Laughed, right? Who heard it, by the way? God did. What does God know about our life? All of it. It's a scary but beautiful thing. Because he knows what you're doing in public. He knows what you're doing in private, right? You live for him, it's a beautiful thing what he sees. You don't live for him, it's going to grieve him, right? It's going to grieve him. So, uh, for I tell you, God is from... Okay, let's see... God is, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. So what is one thing that the Jews were clinging to? They still cling to it today. Um, well, I'm from Abraham, therefore what? I'm good to go. Good to go, right? Is that how it is now? It's not how it is. It's not how it is. Um, even now, verse 10, Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The axe is laid to the root of the trees, sitting there. And then what does it say? Does it say some trees? Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It all goes back to what fruit are we producing? When you look at Matthew 7, 19, it says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will be recognized... Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. How are you recognized today? 
One of the things we always focus on in work that we always, always tell every single employee, how will you be remembered today? By your interaction with people, how will you be remembered today? When people meet you for the first time, the thousandth time, millionth time, however many times, how will they remember you? What will you be remembered for? Luke 13, 7 says, And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? Heaven forbid God said that about our life today. I've been looking, I've been looking for this tree to bear fruit. It still ain't bearing fruit. Just cut it down. Wouldn't that be so sad? Don't let God look down and see that in us today. He should look down and see His children bearing the fruit that we ought to be bearing. Working for Him, right? He shouldn't look down and see a tree that is just dead and just producing nothing. He ought to be able to see it. The world should be able to see us by our good fruit. Then in verse 11 it says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So what is John come doing? What is his baptism for? I heard a couple times. Repentance, right? It says, I baptize with water for repentance. Then he says, but he, is, who, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. It's a great thing that John says there. He who is coming to judge, he who is coming back a second time, he's mightier than I. He's mightier than all of us, right? Who does the battle belong to? The one that's mightier than us. It don't belong to us, right? The world can knock us down uh, just kick us when we're down, all those other things, right? I got someone that's a lot mightier than I on my team, right? On my side. Put him in his right, um, right place. Whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. It's a great respect when he says that right there. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Dale's already smiling. People take this verse out of context a lot. Uh, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What's it talking about? Any, any guesses? You can see Dale twitching over here ready to answer this one. Dale, go for it. Some of the folks that John's speaking to as disciples are the next day or the next day going to follow after Jesus. One of those is Andrew and the other one is John. And uh, the two of them are going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So it's going to be, and you'll see it in Acts. The other thing that gets really misconstrued on this is when it says, and fire. Um, this is where we'll get some groups that will say you're just baptized with the Holy Spirit. Some people will say they were baptized over the phone and the Holy Spirit became upon them, right? And the fire. When you look at the context of the right after this, where it mentions fire, and right above it where it mentions fire, what do we think the fire is in context? Is that fire something good? Fire's bad. Fi yeah, fire's bad, right? Touch the oven and it's hot, is it not? Right? Baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Before, what's it talking about? The tree is cut down and thrown into fire. What's that talking about? Torment, hell, right? Separated from God. After this, it's going to be talking about uh, the threshing floor. And, he, and then what? Will be burned with unquenchable what? Fire. What's unquenchable? Did the rich man have a uh, quenchable thirst when he reached out and asked for Lazarus? Unquenchable, right? Great agony. God's word, this right here is what we're going to be judged on and how we live our life according to this. This right here is what's going to send us. Our actions based off of this is what's going to send us to fire, right? Uh, when you look at Pharaoh, 
and Pharaoh's hardening of his heart. What's hardening the heart of Pharaoh? The word of God is, right? Now, the word of God is not coming directly from God, right? It's going through a mediator, right? Moses and Aaron. But the word of God is what is hardening his heart. We can't let the word of God harden our heart today, right? We can read that later on in Scripture where it says, don't let his commandments be burdensome to us. They shouldn't be burdensome to us because they're for our good. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I want to continue on. But anyways, don't let people take that out of context. Read the context before and after. Verse 12, his winnowing fork is uh, in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. The, uh, the wooden fork, the pitchfork, you could call it, um, is to toss the grain up in the air so that the uh, wind can separate the lighter straw from the heavier grain. And then once that is done, then you would clear the threshing floor, um, and that's when the winnowing shovel would come in. And so it's in his hand. It's in his hand. What does that mean? He's ready to go. He said, he's like, not yet. Close, right? I don't know. He's waiting, right? It's in his hand. He's prepared. What does that mean? It means it's coming, right? It's coming. So it's in his hand, um, and he will. Not he might. Not he'll think about it. Not he might change his mind. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, right? That's when you go back and you look at Rahab. How is Rahab saved? from the attack. What did she do? Hanged her what? <laughs> sorry, Scarlet Cord. Scarlet uh, she's a big Michigan fan. It's crazy. You should have seen it. Uh, I'm just kidding. That's a, that's a, jail, a Dale joke. Um, anyways, hung the Scarlet Cord right out the window. And then what'd she do? Stayed in the house. What happened if she left the house? She'd have died. Right? Whenever, whenever Jericho got taken down, what would happen? She wasn't provided safety. Wheat into the barn, and then, but the chaff will, he will burn with unquenchable fire. And that's when you go and you look at the story of the rich man and Lazarus. When you really get a good picture of that. Um, some people want to talk about purgatory and all this other stuff. Uh, boy, that story right there, it don't speak of purgatory. It speaks of there being a gulf right between where you can't get out of it. And the rich man says what? Can you send someone to warn my brothers? I hope we don't meet that day. Can you please tell someone that they should live different once we find that, if that was our home? It's too late. We should be warning people now. It's an unquenchable thirst. Um, and the person that the rich man put below him was now seated in a much better seat. It's not about the victory that you might have today. It's about the victory that you will inherit. It's not about how the world counts victory. It's about how Jesus and the Father count victory. There's two different victories. You can win all day here on earth. You can make a whole lot of money. You can live real nice. You could have uh, less troubles, I guess, because you can buy your way through things. But they don't win you the victory at the end, right? So chase after the victory that Jesus wants us to have. I'm going to get a little bit there. I'm going to do just a little bit. We're going to go into, um, we're going to flip over to John real fast so we can go over a little bit of the baptism. We'll probably cover it a little bit as well next week. But it's John uh, 1, starting in verse 29. And this is when Jesus comes out now. So we've kind of set the scene. It says this, starting in John 1, verse 29. The next day... He saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Write that down, highlight it, circle it. It's a beautiful statement. Takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me. Again, he's putting God in his right, or he's putting Jesus in his rightful place, right? Greater than I, before me, because he was before me. Well, I thought John was older. How much older is John, physically speaking? Six months. Well, how was Jesus before him? Eternal. You go back to John 1, what does it say? In the beginning was what? 
was the Word and what? The Word is with God. Look at us. We know John 1. All right. So he's before him. Because he was before me. Then verse 31. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. When you look at this, and you, if you want to flip back to Matthew, if you want to put your finger, I guess, at Matthew 3, because we're going to kind of go back and forth for just a little bit. But when you look at this, takes away the sin of the world. If you compare that to 1 John uh, 3, verse 5, it's the exact same um, kind of message, um, which I just lost it in my notes. But 1 John 1, 3, 5, it gives us the same exact um, notes if I flip to it. Where it says, you know that he appeared in order to do what? In order to take away sin. And, it, and in him, there is no sin. Why did he appear? Why did he come here? To take away sin, right? So, you know, when you look at, when you look at the beginning of Matthew 3 and you see people thrown into unquenchable fire, is that what God desires? Is that what Jesus came here to do? By no means. He doesn't want anybody to experience that. He appeared what? For what reason? So we don't experience that. So that doesn't have to be our outcome. Right? He's provided a better way. So he takes away the sin of the world. Um, and he says, because he is before me. And if you look at verse uh, Matthew 3, verse 15, you kind of get what Jesus says back. Uh, because it says, in, well, it says in verse 14 of, of Matthew 3, it says, John would have pre prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Could you imagine? Here you are, this guy that just came out of the wilderness, right? As we've seen the description of John. And here comes Jesus wanting to be baptized by you. It would be a wild scene, wasn't it? wouldn't it be? So John says, well, why would you come to me, Right? And then Jesus answered him and says something very uh, interesting. Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Why would he uh, use the word all righteousness, maybe? What was John baptizing for? Repentance. What did Jesus have to repent of? Nothing. Then why would he need to be baptized? and all righteousness. What do you think that says about our life today? How do we fulfill all righteousness? This might just be a step of it, mightn't it? People of the world don't want to include that as a step, right? They get everything and then they get there and they say, ah, nah, nah, nah. Jesus says, no. He says, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So why was Jesus... Baptized right there. For us to fulfill all righteousness. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, who I am well pleased. What a beautiful statement that is. He came to take away the sin from the world, as we can see in John 1. Here you can see, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Fulfilling all righteousness. That's the message that we should all aim to hear on our judgment day. I know him. I know her. The best part is, he doesn't say him or her. 
because he knows you. I've used the example before, but when you look at the creation process and you look at our salvation process, go into the creation first, God is kind of your, um, he's the person that kind of puts together your blueprint. Jesus kind of comes through and just, const- or, yeah, Jesus comes through and constructs everything, then the Holy Spirit does what? It's like your interior designer, perfecter, right? Comes through and perfects everything. Then you look at what? Then you look at our salvation. God comes up with the blueprint of it. This is what salvation is going to look like. Jesus comes down, lives it, fulfills it, builds it, right? He builds our salvation for us, right? Dies so that we can contact his blood. Then what, then what does the Holy Spirit do? Come through and helps perfect it, right? Helps give us this word. It's a beautiful thing. You can see the same kind of, the same kind of concept in creation as you can see in the creation of our salvation. The creation of a new life. So when we have our... You have something to do. Well, I was just thinking that there's some religious groups that teach that God is one personality and that He reveals Himself in three different ways. That He reveals Himself as a Father, or He reveals Himself as a Son, or He reveals Himself as the Holy Spirit. But that He's basically one personality. Well, I don't know what you do with this <laughs> section here because you've got all three personalities that are in the Godhead, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all together here in one place. And it's obviously not just one personality. You skip it. But it does show a beautiful um, oneness, unitedness in that same mission. That's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what the world should see in us today. You can see the oneness or the unitedness, um, you could say, in the scripture here. People should see the same thing when they look at the church today. And he wants us desperately, right? I mean, that's what he desires, is for us to be united, to be one with him. Right? He didn't, I mean, I've said this numerous times. He didn't create hell for us. Who did he create hell for? 
devil and his angels. Satan and his angels, right? Who did he create heaven for? Us. Where does he want us to inherit? Heaven, right? And so he came, he made this appearance to take away sin from the world. To, to live here, to be an example, to die so that we could live eternally with him. You know, we talked about um, uh, the, the vine dresser with the, with the vineyard, right? And, he, and, and looking down at the tree and saying, this tree's not born any fruit, good fruit in three years. Just, just cut it down. What is your life today would be the question. We have two different or three different mentions here in Matthew 1 um, about this separation that's to take place, the wrath of God that is to come. Who warned you was the question I asked towards the beginning of the lesson. Who warned you of the wrath to come? The wrath is to come. Don't let any of us here or anybody else that is out there not know of the salvation plan that is right there before them. So they don't have to face that wrath, right? Don't go to court representing yourself. Not even a lawyer, right? They say lawyers shouldn't represent themselves. Why? You ain't going to win. I'm definitely not going to win if I'm represent myself. Thank goodness we have a better lawyer, a better person advocating for us. It's Jesus. If you don't have Jesus advocating for you, it's going to be a tough day in the courtroom when it gets there. If you have anything weighing on your heart tonight, leave it here so that you can leave free as Christ wants you to leave. So that you can leave uh, without that burden. Give that burden over to Him. He's greater than us. He is able to handle it. Able to handle far more than our minds, as Kathy said, can even comprehend. Likewise, if you've... Uh, if you've never given your life to Him, if you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins and uh, let Jesus be your uh, mediator in the courtroom on that final day, you have the opportunity tonight to do that so that you can win that court case at the end of this journey here on life or here on the end of this journey on the earth. Mess that up. You believe it? If you have anything, you can come forward as we stand and as we sing. Brian.